Good afternoon. It looks like we are at four o'clock, but I know we're waiting for a few more folks to join us. We might give people a minute or two to log on. Sarah, Mike, do you want to kind of set the stage for what we'll be doing while we're waiting for the last few folks to log on? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. What I can say is that this is a work session um, of the Board of County Commissioners, which means uh, there's no official action taken at these at this meeting. It is simply for informational and educational purposes only. And I will turn it over to Mike Brower. Thanks, Sarah. The, this is Mike Brower, and thank you, commissioners, for your time this afternoon. I'm going to be, try to be brief, but probably um, provide you some background um, so I can let the experts talk um, most of the time this afternoon. Um, but just for in way of background, um, you know, over the past year, the CJCC has been um, asking each of our key stakeholders in the criminal justice system to look for ways to decrease their usage and improve efficiencies of our system. Um, and, and this isn't only for the sustainability of our uh, Douglas County Correctional Facility, but it's also for improving community members' interactions with the system. Um, you know, there's really three primary drivers of the system when you're talking about efficiencies and process. That's the District Attorney's Office, the Kansas 7th Judicial District, or we call it District Court, um, and, uh, of course, our defense panel. Um, so Judge McCabria, who, who uh, will be joining us today, um, along with Linda KV, um, or Linda Coaster Bogestang, um, you know, has, has spoken to the commission in the past about some of their efforts that they are doing, um, along with shared those with the uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and um, multiple articles in the journal world. Um, you know, District Attorney Valdez um, presented fairly recently the new Enhanced Diversion Program as part of these efforts. And, um, and is working on some other initiatives that I'm sure she'll be sharing with you in the future. Um, and so today we're gonna to kind of talk about the third pillar of, of this system um, and, and that is our defense services. Um, you know, compared to the other two systems where we have a chief judge and we have a, a district attorney who are appointed by the state or elected by our citizens, um, the, uh, the, the defense panel is made up of private contractors living in our community, working in our community who um, um, receive their appointments from the district court. Um, but nonetheless, they play a very significant role in our process and our efficiencies. Um, so, um, you know, it makes sense as we're asking the other partners to, um, to look at new ways of doing things, to look at opportunities for improvement, that we ask the same question of our defense services. Um, so um, the CJCC solicited uh, last year for the Kansas Board of Indigent Services or BIDS um, to do a presentation on um, um, how those services are applied and opportunities for administration, which for most people um, includes the possibility of a public defender's office. Um, then also um, we received a presentation from um, the um, Kansas Holistic Defenders, uh, Sam, Allison, Natalia, um, is, is representing them here today. Um, he um, um, and this kind of new concept of providing holistic defense, um, specifically for our misdemeanor populations. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I do want to make clear is, um, you know, Brandon Barrett um, is, is joining us today. He's re representing bids. Um, and uh, Sam, you know, these are two separate programs, two separate funding sources for at this time, two separate populations of our criminal justice system. Um, and uh, we invited them to be part of this conversation today because I hope this is the beginning of taking a um, kind of macro approach look at what is best for providing these services in our community. Um, and so I hope this is the first of many conversations, um, but I wanted to, um, gain the perspective of as many partners as possible. 
Um, so also joining us today is Mike Clark, um, who is a member of the Douglas County Defense Bar um, and also provider of indigent services in our community, and Shay Downing, but with the same credentials in addition to the fact that Shay has also uh, been a member of our Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for the past five years. Um, in addition to which, um, just publicly, I want to share that uh, Commissioner Patil um, submitted a letter to bids expressing the interest for Douglas County to be assessed for what is the best and most effective way to provide defense services in Douglas County. This is something that bids does on an ongoing basis. I'm sure Mr. Barrett will tell us more about that. Um, but we, um, but uh, we felt it was important to make a formal um, expression of that interest. Um, and, um, and she uh, recently uh, met with a uh, board of um, bids here earlier this month. Um, the, uh, just in the way of wrap up, um, you know, this is, I kind of submitted a timed agenda for, um, for all the partners here today. I did that for the purpose of, I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to share. Um, uh, but I hope that this is still very much a conversational form, um, of exchange of ideas and educational opportunity. Um, that's, um, the study sessions I've been in the past have been in that format, and I've I found it to be very educational for all of us. Um, so I hope that as um, each partner proceeds, that we'll, we'll, um, commissioners, you'll feel free to ask questions, ask for clarification, and um, and then partners, um, um, just do your best to stay within the time constraints so everyone has the opportunity. So with that, a um, bit of background. I'm going to kick it off to uh, Mr. Barrett. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming to Douglas County today. And um, if you'll just please talk to us a little bit about uh, bids. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Barrett. I'm the staff attorney with the Board of Indigenous Defense Services. I'm uh, speaking today in place of Director Cessna. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak with you guys today about bids involvement. I'd like to start by following up on something that was just mentioned, and that is this is a separate um, concept from what Ms. Travelson Atali is going to be presenting today. Our role in the criminal justice system statewide is for adult felony cases, um, not for misdemeanors and not for juvenile cases. Our funding comes from the state legislature, um, at least as, the, as it generally operates, it does. So it, it is fundamentally a little bit different than what you'll hear a little bit later today. Under KSA 22-4522, BIDS has the authority to control how indigent defense is provided in a given county or a group of counties if a public defender office is opened there. It also gives us a procedure that must be followed, which includes an analysis and opportunity for public hearings. Um, with the presentation of the um, letter of interest, we've started that process, but it's still very early. That statute also gives us a responsibility to try to provide the best possible defense under the circumstances for each indigent, indigent defendant throughout the state at the most economical price point that it can be done. If the board decides to expand public defender services into Douglas County, that's going to be in addition to the appointed council panel system that already exists. That full system, a full and robust panel system is important to any sort of provision of defense services anywhere in the state. We have public defender offices in multiple counties throughout the state of Kansas. Each one of those relies not only on the public defender office that's there, but on the panel and appointed counsel and occasionally contract attorneys within that system. Panel attorneys are an important partner in that framework. And often that comes into play when you deal with conflicts of interest, either you have multiple defendant cases or you have some sort of conflict of personality between individuals. But this system works as a matter of cooperation, not as a matter of replacement. It's also important to note, and I don't know, um, how well known this is at this point, but as we speak, legislation is being worked on to raise the panel attorney rate from $80 an hour to $100 an hour. That's not finalized at this point, but that is something that's being suggested um, as a further investment in the panel attorney system and further evidence that this is something that we look at as a, a symbiotic situation and not as one over the other. Right now, this process is at a very early stage. No change is imminent. Any change would require a vote of the board. Um, no vote is at this time scheduled or has taken place, but the process has begun, although the wheels turn slowly. 
the assessment that was mentioned by Mr. Brower involves looking at a few different factors in any given jurisdiction, um, in this case, Douglas County. Look at the the, pay, the attorneys that currently exist, their, lo, their level of experience, the types of cases that are typically handled in whatever that jurisdiction may be. The costs associated with the provision of that defense, the nature of appeals that have been generated by that jurisdiction over a period of time, typically five years is the time frame that we use. Um, Back it up just a moment here. And then finally getting input from local stakeholders more directly, whether that be in public hearings or whether that be through individual interviews or people submitting testimony to the board for any given hearing. With any expansion of bids offices or government expansion generally, oftentimes there is a desire to be heard. That desire can be accomplished in a few different ways. Built into the procedure under KSA 22-4522 is a requirement for some public hearings. Those would be accomplished at the local level. There would also be board hearings through the Board of Engines Defense Services here in Topeka in April and June. And then depending on when votes might be held, August and September also have board meetings, which depend on the scheduling as to when board hearings would be appropriate for this particular issue. As things currently stand, I know that um, Director Cessna had presented a rough estimate of just north of $800,000 per year to operate an office there. It's based on a similarly sized office that we have elsewhere in the state. Startup costs would add a little bit to that, but I think $810,000 annually is the expected rate of which $700,000 would be expected salaries for attorneys and support staff. Um, generally speaking, um, that would be the number, although that is open to some movement at this point. There are still some factors that are not accounted for, such as what a precise rent on a precise building might be. That might change the number. Mr. Barrett, do you know how many, how many attorneys that contemplates? Six. Thank you. Uh, six attorneys and four support staff would be anticipated by that number. And really for, for today, that's all I have for anything to say directly. Um, I appreciate the chance to speak with you. I thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm available to answer any questions you guys may have. This is Commissioner Portillo. Mr. Baird, I really appreciate that overview about the bids process. I think it is also important to point out that this is something that Governor Kelly's Commission on Racial Equity and Justice has taken up from a statewide perspective. And the commission did recommend that all jurisdictions over 100,000 people have an institutional public defender's office. And those recommendations went, of course, to the legislature and to bids. We know that it is a slow moving process. We know that there, that would require a significant increase in funding from our state legislature, but from the commission on racial equity and justice perspective, we do think that this is a racial equity issue and one that should be supported by our state and localities when it comes to larger jurisdictions like Douglas County. And commissioners, I should mention um, that Director Cessna intended to uh, meet with us today. Um, she was called at the last minute into um, a legislative committee to advocate for several millions of dollars and more funding for bids, which I think we're all in support of. And so I appreciate um, Mr. Barrett uh, coming, stepping in to last minute, so. Thank you. So I, I do have a question for Mr. Barrett and he's received my open record requests, um, at least two in the last month that I'm still waiting on. But one of my questions has to do with the assertion that bids and public defenders are a more economical method of administering defense services and would be so in Douglas County. I assume that that assertion assumes that there won't be an increase in the pay rate for bids attorneys, is that true? The numbers that are being um, estimated right now are going to be a little bit fluid while we're waiting on the legislature to come back with 
numbers both for panel attorney potential raises and for budgetary um, issues within bids itself. So unfortunately, there isn't a solid answer to that question as we sit here right now. Well, I think there is because bids is trying to increase the rate for public defender pay in the state, true? It is. So if that rate increase is granted, then the numbers that are being relied upon aren't gonna be valid, right? Numbers would be updated throughout the process if funding is granted. Okay, well, they're, they're only gonna go up, right? For both sides, like panel attorney rates are going up and salaries are going up. So both sides of that equation are going in the upward direction. That's what's been proposed and is being debated, yes. All right. Any idea when I might get an answer to those open record requests? Um, I can be in the office for a little bit after we finish this. If you'd like to give me a call, the number provided on my letter. Can't answer the question now. It's beyond the scope of the meeting, sir. I hate to jump in. Um, I'm trying to facilitate this conversation. This is Mike Brower. Um, you know, these are kind of side conversations and to addition to the study session for the commission. And so while I, I don't mean to cut you off on the opportunity, we do want to stay on topic. Well, I have a question, not necessarily about that, but in terms of the numbers that you gave, if I understood um, what was being proposed, it was 700,000 of the 800,000 for salaries, right? Was is, Did I write that part down? That's the current estimate, yes. Okay. And so then um, on top of that, though, the $800,000 that you gave did not include what would still need to be paid for panel attorneys for a conflict or anything like that, right? Because you'd still have those. We don't know what those numbers look like. That number would be separate and apart from the 800,000. The 800,000 number is the number for operating the office for public defenders at a rate of six attorneys and four support staff unto itself. So the additional okay. 100,000 or so would be overhead, office rent, utilities, things of that nature. I'm sorry, I muted myself. So if we were going to, in Douglas County, go to a system where... Um, we had the public defender's office for misdemeanors, right? That 800,000 is about the misdemeanors or is that a public defender's office for all cases? The state public defender system handles only adult felonies. So the misdemeanors would actually be handled by um, another group. I know that uh, Mr. Allison Natale's group has mentioned that, but that would be beyond, be beyond the scope of bids representation. Okay, I just want to make sure I was understanding what you're talking about. So what you're talking about is $800,000 to have a public defender's office who addresses the felony stuff, then you'd have the additional amount that had to be paid to panel attorneys. And I guess we could get probably a rough estimate of what that would look like by looking like at Shawnee County to see what they're doing based on population numbers. But okay, that's a separate number. And then there'd be yet a third number that we would need to have um, for misdemeanors. And then a fourth number for misdemeanors, the misdemeanor panel attorneys who did the conflicts with the misdemeanor defender's office. That's correct. But the funding for the bids office is typically going to be coming from the state directly and not from the county. Right. So the proposition in general would be for the state general fund to be the source of funding for any given bids office or any given bids um, movement. So that number, though not known entirely at this moment would be coming from a different funding source than these other numbers. And so while I can't speak to what those numbers are, I can say that they are going to be different in kind in that respect. Right. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, commissioners, if you don't have any questions, we're going to um, allow um, Mr. Allison Natalia to, um, to take the floor. Um, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. I'm actually going to be turning it over to uh, my colleague on the uh, Kansas Holistic Defenders Board, uh, Jennifer Roth. Um, uh, some of you might recognize her from her appearances in the legislature. She's been an attorney, a public defender for more than 20 years. Um, she has been a frequent flyer at the legislature and on the Kansas Sentencing Commission um, and um, 
I really appreciate her on the board and um, she'll be sort of opening the floor for us today and then we'll take uh, questions. Thanks, Sam. Um, my name is Jennifer Roth. And in addition to being a public defender for over 20 years, I've been a Lawrence resident for over 30 in Long Kansas. Um, so thank you for this opportunity today. Um, I come at this with pretty strong feelings because the entire of my career, both as a trial level public defender and an appellate defender, have been in hybrid systems. Um, I used to be in Shawnee County for 13 years where we worked with panel attorneys and private attorneys, or well, they're all private attorneys. But, um, and then at the appellate level, we also work with people who um, are private attorneys as well. Um, we get uh, phone calls from private attorneys. Uh, we call private attorneys. Uh, so my entire experience comes from being in the system and seeing how that is better for everyone. Um, I'm not sure you know, what questions you might have for me or exactly what all, I, so I guess I'm saying chime in, but I just want you to know that uh, we have examples of how these hybrid systems have worked. Um, Mr. Barrett uh, has told you that this is about cooperation. Um, things are better for everyone when you have a hybrid system. Um, and um, so that's my experience. I've seen it work in, um, in our public defender system. You can see that, that it's worked in towns small and large. Um, so I, like I said, I have pretty strong feelings about that. I'm happy to answer um, any questions about how those two things do work together in real life. Um, Sam, do you have things you want to, other things you want me to, I don't want to hog the conversation here. No, no, I mean, um... Yeah, I think we're trying to thread the needle here between, um, you know, presenting information, much of which was already presented for the CJCC um, and answering questions. Um, you know, I do want to, uh, I guess, lay out what uh, our view of the situation is, um, because I think there's a tremendous opportunity here uh, for Douglas County. We're one of only two counties of our size in Kansas without a dedicated public defender office. The governor's office on racial justice and equity has recommended that counties of our size invest in a public defender office. And this is also the suggestion of the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys uh, in their guidance that hybrid systems uh, are favored. Now across the country, jurisdictions are adopting the holistic defense model because it's been proven to provide effective outcomes for clients and save money in the long term for counties by reducing jail stays, recidivism, and failures to appear. And we have a tremendous opportunity to be part of this movement, to be a model for Kansas in how we provide criminal defense services to poor and working class people. And I understand this is an area where we feel uncertain. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions to be answered. We have so many services in this county that can be utilized by a holistic defender office, but how is that gonna work in pro practice? Does the county have the funding to make this investment? How will our office be of service to the broader defense community? Uh, how will we be accountable to our judges, to our community, to our county? These are all questions um, that we're gonna have to work through, but the strength that we have is that answering these questions is a shared responsibility. We are gonna benefit from the experience of holistic defenders offices around the country who volunteer to contribute guidance in establishing these best practices. Uh, we have uh, local attorneys and panel members who have voiced willingness to make sure our office uh, deeply understands local conditions and adopts best practices for work here in Douglas County. We have a judiciary that cares deeply about the quality of indigent defense and which has been working uh, to provide Kansas holistic defenders with guidance and input. Uh, and we'll continue to work with uh, our judges every step of the way. Uh, we have a new DA, a new county commission, or at least two new county commissioners. Um, we have a new sheriff, all of whom came in with a commitment to continue the work of uh, improving uh, outcomes in our system. And most importantly, we have a community that's shown up time and time again to imagine and demand and work towards a better justice system. And we are so appreciative of the work that's already been done by our county to improve the outcomes in our criminal legal system. And we appreciate the work of the CJCC. We appreciate the work of all of the attorneys who are currently representing uh, and working to represent uh, people accused of misdemeanors. Um, 
you know, the bottom line is we have everything that we need in Douglas County to make a vision of holistic defense a success um, and um, to, uh, to do the best for people accused of crimes to get out of the system and stay out of the system. Um, and, you know, I think Jennifer touched on uh, a lot of what can be better here, um, but I want to, uh, before we open up for questions, just turn it back over to her, because I think she's right that this is going to be a benefit to everybody. I, I guess I'm going to go a little off here, off notes here, but um, one thing I wanted to mention is that last Thursday, I think it was, it was the anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright. So I celebrate that as a holiday. Um, that's the SCOTUS case that tells us that everybody has the right to have an attorney. Um, and so in, in, in um, sort of preparing for that holiday, I talked to people who were part of public defender offices started. And sort of the common theme was that there was some resistance. There was people not sure about these uh, new public defenders and their offices. And that over time, people came to realize this hybrid system is what works and it works better. And if you went to those jurisdictions today and said, by the way, we're gonna to return to a panel only system, uproar. And the reason is because a hybrid system works better for everyone. Oh, it says my connection's unstable. Um, that it for everyone, whether that's the clients, whether that's the police, whether that's the public defenders, if we can all work together the other thing I would say that seems random, but it's not, is I went to an appellate review. So I'm an appellate defender. I read cases from all over the entire state, including this county. So I get a sense of what's happening everywhere. And what I can tell you is that there are people, private and public defenders, who are overworked. They do not have the time or the resources to follow, you know, know all the changes in the law, whether that comes from the courts or the legislature. And so times where I think I'm just going to win the lottery, quit my job, and just basically be a resource for everyone. Because they cannot, we cannot do it by ourselves. The private people, we all need each other to make the system stronger. And I believe that that is recognized by all the players in the system. You know, importantly, our clients. Um, so, see, I have a lot of feelings about this. And I really do think that it's better for everyone when you have of a hybrid system. This is Commissioner Perdue here. Um, Sam and Jennifer, thanks for that. And Jennifer, I appreciate your, um, your passion and your experience with it. Since you have had so much experience with um, hybrid systems, and I heard you mention Shawnee County especially, um, I'm curious if you can help us get kind of a, a broad overview of, of what that would look like from, let, let's just talk about misdemeanors, um, a misdemeanor case being charged and how is that routed through the public defense and or panel attorney conflict um, list? What does that look like? So... I did not do misdemeanors in Shawnee County, but obviously I knew the people who did. And <laughs> try and do a misdemeanor, I was often told, no, you can't do this. Because by statute, public defender, the people that work at bids aren't supposed to do misdemeanors. But that said, the way it worked is there were, a, you know, I think there were three attorneys um, who had contracts to do the majority of the misdemeanor case in Topeka. And, um, you know, I haven't been a trial level person for about five years, but I think they're the same people. They still are overworked and have too many cases. Um, but that's how that worked is that they were primarily handled by those three folks. You know, the um, appointments were by those three folks. And then I'm sure they had to go there or something like that. So that's how that worked in Shawnee County. Um, but we talked to them too. They'd sometimes call us and we'd sometimes call them because we would have clients in common, which, sorry, this is sort of a random part to this answer, but one of the things that Mr. Barrett said was that these are two separate populations, misdemeanors and felonies, and I'd argue that's not true. Um, that, well, not that Brandon's lying. I'm just saying that it's that that's true that PUP bids does felonies and we, the, um, 
you know, that the people on the panel do the misdemeanors. But the point is we have clients where they overlap. And so we would work together too. So not only is there attorneys and public defenders, but also people who do misdemeanors and who do felonies. So sorry, I didn't word that so, so hot in the first place, but that's how it worked in Shawnee County um, because we weren't supposed to do misdemeanors. And I just want to add one more thing to that answer, uh, Commissioner Reed, that um, the statute gives uh, counties the authority to contract with bids to be an institutional provider for misdemeanors. Um, but that is not typically uh, how it's done. As, as far as we know, um, there isn't anything like what we're proposing yet in Kansas in terms of a single office that is, uh, you know, just handling as a nonprofit uh, misdemeanor cases. Um, and so we're making an analogy to a hybrid system similar to what happens in felonies in Shawnee County, but there is not a uh, institutional misdemeanor provider uh, in Shawnee County in the same way, if that answers your question as well. That's good clarity, thank you. Can I chime in? Briefly, I I do work in Shawnee County um, and I do work here. Um, so what I would say is actually one of the major differences between how the counties do it is something that's highlighted by your question. Right now, if you are a defendant in Douglas County and let's say you have two cases, you have one where the top charge is a misdemeanor and you have one case where the top charge is a felony. What happens in Douglas County is generally you would be appointed to one attorney who would then handle both of your cases. So for instance, if that's going to happen, I can go to the prosecutor and try to address a global resolution. I can make sure that the trial schedule makes sense so that I don't have my client basically have a bunch of misdemeanors, which could impact his criminal history such that when we get to the felony, he's looking at a lot more time. In Shawnee County, that's not what happens they are in front of different judges and they have different attorneys. And the complication with that is in that same fact pattern, which is one, a situation I have now, my client is charged with a first degree murder in this case, okay? He has some misdemeanor things that will impact his criminal history, which means if he's convicted in my case, then the sentence he looks at is worse than if my case goes first and then they address the other ones. But because they are separated and there are different judges hearing it, there is not the same ability to be able to come up with a resolution for all of it or to adjust the schedule of one case so that that doesn't happen. And um, as it relates to conflicts, Shawnee County has not only the defender's office, but then they have an in-house, essentially a conflicts panel, mainly for felonies, uh, misdemeanors. I think they have to do it a little differently. Then they have a secondary conflicts panel that addresses that. And then they have people like me who are contracted separately after that. Um, and if I could just respond to that, um, the, um, you know, one thing, the good news is that this, problem of double representation is really easy to solve in this context because our proposition would be that if holist the Kansas Holistic Defenders represented somebody on a misdemeanor and they pick up a felony, we would just want our attorneys to be um, on the felony bids panel to be able to represent them continuously um, on uh, their misdemeanor and their felony. I think that makes the most sense um, and that's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and is also, you know, one of the reasons we're so grateful to be working with bids is that as this goes forward, we can have any number of different types of relationship uh, with bids as bids in the county uh, finds most appropriate. Um, but our proposition would be to avoid what happens um, in uh, Shawnee County where there's a panel only system for misdemeanors and an institutional defender for uh, felonies that we should have, I think, ideally, uh, you know, an institutional defender for both or an institutional defender that can handle people on their misdeme misdemeanors and then also if they pick up a felony, which would be the proposition for our office as well.
Ms. Commissioner Kelly, um, the first part of my question is maybe for Sam and Jennifer. I appreciated your presentation of the CJCC. There was a lot there that helped me understand sort of what you're, what you're offering. And I was really interested in understanding more about the holistic side of, of it, you know, and, you know, taken with the numbers on of failure to appear, reducing what the studies are showing about failure to appear and sort of what what those services that you are planning to do outside of just defense. And then the second part would be to ask maybe Sarah and Mike to say, how is that different than what we're doing now or, or more than what we're doing now? Um, so maybe Sam and Jennifer first. I have to defer to Sam on that one because we don't have the resources exactly to practice holistic defense. Is one reason why I'm excited about this project, um, where things are moving. So I'm turning that to Sam. Yeah, I can tell you that having worked in a uh, practiced in a holistic office um, and uh, practiced not in a holistic office, the, the difference is night and day. Um, so, um, you know, let's say that uh, there is, uh, you know, you go in, first of all, um, you know, an institutional defender's office, the county would have the option, we don't have to do it, would have the option of having counsel ready to go at first appearances. Um, and we don't, you know, you could do it with that, you could do it without that. But at a minimum, we have attorneys who are ready to go uh, as early in the case um, as the court finds practicable to uh, be able to represent people. We, uh, in my office, we would have an investigator on staff. I could make a referral to, you know, go uh, get the surveillance footage right away, right? And that person is in-house. I don't have to contract with them um, on down the road. They're just there. Um, I would go and, you know, interview the client in jail and screen them for a whole bunch of things. And we would obviously, in this context, I think work with um, the, uh, the pre-screening that happens uh, at the jail. And if we determined that, uh, you know, there was some mental health need, my social worker, the social worker in the office was right there to come and talk to that client, um, get a little deeper insight into the, uh, the issues that might be going on there, whether it's competency, whether it's uh, drugs or something else, um, and be able to know exactly who to contact uh, even before we talk about bond, to talk about a release plan, right? Uh, to talk about um, what services can we get them into so that, uh, you know, uh, our judge can make the best decision about uh, whether uh, bond is, um, is appropriate. Um, you know, on through the case, maybe as a result of their arrest, they now have, um, you know, uh, their boss is talking about firing them. Um, our office would have on staff a role called client advocate that can handle a lot of these collateral consequences, the way that an, uh, even a simple arrest can, these ripple effects into somebody's life. Um, this is somebody who's paid on staff to get on the phone with that boss and, uh, you know, try and advocate for them to not be fired, can uh, talk to a landlord, can help uh, find this person housing, get them connected back on benefits. Um, you know, there's uh, 101 things that can go wrong that aren't, you know, within the typical purview of everything that, you know, a lawyer does when we're concerned in a traditional model of the four corners of the case in the courtroom. Um, so those are, uh, are, are parts of, of what it looks like. And this is also especially important for coordinating with other attorneys that the person might need. Um, because there's often family court involvement. Uh, there is often immigration consequences, right? And having people who are trained to work in a team uh, to uh, provide those makes a, makes a huge difference um, in what an attorney is, is, is able to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the first half. And, and so I can, I can chime in with a little bit on the second half and obviously defer to Mike for more information. And, and that's why I guess I would stress here that this is a very preliminary early part of the conversation because what I'd wanna make sure is that we're not duplicating services that the county has invested significant efforts into investing over the last several years. 
Criminal Justice Services does significant pretrial services. I wouldn't, you know, many folks already have case management in the community and we wouldn't want to duplicate that service. So my understanding of some of the value of having a holistic team was also to help inform the attorneys about many of the issues involved, less about direct service provision and client services. So I see Mr. Natali uh, nodding his head. So I do think that's one of those things that we would need to work through in this model is what are the what is appropriate for pretrial services to do in their assessments and their liaisoning, their their connections with case management, their connections with service providers in the community, and how do they communicate then with an attorney um, so that they're aware of all of those different issues? Did I miss anything there, Mike? That you want to make sure we talk through? Uh, yeah, I would I would say one thing. Um, thank you, Sarah. This is Mike Brar and. and um, I'm, I'm going to go back and put my reentry director hat back on, um, and uh, and and, and uh, clarify one thing, Commissioner Kelly, is that I can confidently say there's not a jail in the country that is providing more screening and assessment by clinical social workers and by licensed drug and alcohol counselor prior to first appearance than Douglas County is doing. The, the problem we ran into as we began developing the aid program five years ago is that only about 10% of that information, that's a rough estimate, the journal world's listening, don't quote me on that, right? It's a rough estimate, uh, but um, only about 10% of the information is really getting utilized in um, the decisions that's being made at the court level. And we have met with the defense bar over the years and, and, and talked to the DA's office and how do we do that with not with respecting the person's rights. So when Sam um, began talking about this concept of holistic offense, which I was not aware of until this year, I said, man, this, this fits like a glove to services that we've worked really hard that you have financed to, to put in place um, where we could really reach a higher level of efficiency. Um, now, I'll, I'll say this, so is, is that one thing is I put in your packet um, a, um, a kind of a data analysis of misdemeanor only cases in the Kansas District Court um, by Dr. Cravens. And, um, and, and so you see those numbers aren't huge uh, in the number of people with misdemeanor only cases. Um, so, and that's why I figure that, that part of this conversation, I know that, that Mr. Natalia is right now is talking about misdemeanors. But, but also in, in the grander scheme of things, um, if we only did misdemeanors, we would be missing a lot of individuals who could utilize um, services that we know about and we just can't get the plug in that final piece connected. So. I may, just because we have Ms. Downing and Mr. Clark, and I know Mr. Clark came on the appointment panel here in Douglas County about the same time I did. And I apologize, Shay, I can't remember how long you've been on. I think close to that same time. No, no, no. We don't need to talk about how old I am. We're good. We're good. <laughs> well, based on your experience, how is what you do for your misdemeanor clients different from what Mr. Natali is describing as the advantages of the holistic office? What are you hearing that you think, oh my gosh, had never thought of that, or we don't have that ability, or is there, I mean, it's been a while since I've been on the misdemeanor panel, so. What, well, what I would say, and I, I will tell everyone, I have told this directly to Mr. Allison Natali, but um, some of the things that he has said that would be part of that system do not make sense in the context of Douglas County. And I've tried to explain that from someone who practices here. For instance, um, some of the things in theory make a lot of sense, like having an investigator who could go and retrieve surveillance footage and not having to address a delay. But the problem with that in Douglas County is very few misdemeanors have people who are arrested and in custody at the time that a, an attorney is appointed or first appearances. Generally what happens is if you're charged with the misdemeanor, you would get a sense, essentially a notice to appear at a later date. So whether that is the defender's office or a private attorney, you're not getting it where you would have an investigator be able to go the next day and retrieve 
information. That's not something that as a practical matter um, makes sense. I, um, most of the time, even when we talk about services that are available, Douglas County is small and large at the same time in that there is a very finite subset of services that are available and there are a very finite list of providers that we send them to. So when I have a misdemeanor client who's got some mental health issues or who has a substance abuse issue, um, the people that we are contacting is a very small list. I have seen it make sense when you're in communities that have 10 different providers. And so having someone on staff who knows who to call at each individual place in order to get them set up would make sense. But in Douglas County here, that's generally not what happens. The attorney meets with their client, they identify those issues, they get them set up with services right away, or at least con in contact with who they need to do that with. And Mr. Uh, Mike Brower is correct. And usually a lot of that is done before we ever meet with our client. There's some assessment done. And I know that people who've been on the CJCC remember us doing the praxis and trying to figure out the pretrial screening tools and how to identify those issues. And so that we didn't have people who remained in custody um, when they shouldn't have been. So for misdemeanors, what he has suggested would be part of the program does not, I, I don't understand how that fits into Douglas County's specific system. Mike, anything to add to that? Just curious. Yes, Judge. Um, you know, when I've talked to other members of the defense panel here in town, um, I think everyone kind of feels a little attacked by this. It seems somewhat sudden um, because I think there's quite a bit of pride within the panel in terms of the efforts that we make. And it seems like I'm not sure what the problem is because as Ms. Downing kind of alluded to, we're already making referrals to Burt Nash or to the VA. And we've routinely done CLEs for our, our defense bar um, so that they know how to make referrals to the VA. We had an immigration attorney give us quite a detailed presentation this year. Uh, we've had Heartland Radak come in and give us presentations. Burt Nash, next week we've got artists uh, helping the homeless is going to make a presentation. So we've got, you know, Mr. Natale seems to be spearheading this, and I can't see that he's ever handled a case in Douglas County, and yet he's coming in here telling us we have these problems that we need solved, and this is news to us. And quite frankly, if it was something that was going to benefit all our clients, then why didn't they come to us and present it to us and say, this is a better model of doing business, the comments that I've heard is it just seems like he's trying to get Douglas County to pay for his new law firm. Um, so this is Commissioner Portillo. I do think that we need to be a bit careful about some of these assertions here because this is not a conversation that is coming out of nowhere, nor is it a conversation that's specific to Douglas County. There have been nationwide conversations around the criminal legal system and the ways in which public defense plays a role. There have been statewide conversations about the criminal legal system and the ways in which public defense plays a role. When we talk about public defender systems, we know there are a number of really amazing defense attorneys in Douglas County. We know there are a number of really amazing defense attorneys on our panel. And we know that there's room for improvement when it comes to racial equity within the criminal legal system. And there is a reason that statewide we're having these conversations and there's a reason why in Douglas County we're having these conversations. So I, I don't think that this conversation is coming out of nowhere. It preceded my involvement on Douglas County's commission because the CJCC has been having these conversations. And I remember back when I was an undergrad at KU 20 years ago, people having conversations about what does an institutional defender's office look like? Should Douglas County have it or not? These are conversations that have been had over time, but I think in this time, we know that there is a call for racial justice across the country and across our state. We're looking at what are some of the institutional responses because some of the really great training that you're talking about, the defense bar taking up through CLEs and things like that, those can be institutionalized if we have a specific organization that's focused on 
public defense. And we can see some mentorship for younger attorneys. We can do a lot of that in a more institutionalized way that supports our goals for better indigent defense for our entire community and the ways in which this is part of an ongoing discussion nationwide about the criminal legal system and reforms that we need to take. So I think we need to be really careful about where this conversation came from and how sudden it is or is not. Well, you're entitled to your opinion and I was invited to give my feedback and so that's what I'm doing. Well, this I, is Mike Prower. Let me pipe Thank in you. for just a second if I can. Sure, Judge. Try to, Absolutely. I, I've known Mike Clark a long time. I know he has strong opinions about this. And I guess my question to Shay and to Mike and maybe what, if I'm gonna interpret what Mike is saying is he didn't hear anything that Mr. Natali is saying his attorneys would do that the current panel attorneys don't do on a regular basis. Mike, I don't wanna speak for you, but I guess that was what I was trying to find out is, you know, anything that was said is, is that, a new way or a new approach that you think that the misdemeanor panel doesn't already take advantage of. Uh, right. I know what my perspective is from 20 years ago, which was uh, there were some needs and the CJS has provided so much of that uh, and the attorneys take advantage of that, but I don't, I don't have that present experience. So Commissioner Portillo, what, what are the- It's Portillo. Portillo, what are the current panel members, misdemeanor panel members not doing that you think needs to be done? Well, Mike, I think that the, they're hearing from Mr. Natali, these are what we can do. My hope is that the, the current panel can say either, hey, those are things we're doing or hey, those are ideas that we haven't thought of before. And I don't know. Uh, and, and Judge, if I can interject here, essentially that what you're seeing and what Mike is saying I think are not that far apart. And that is my questions, my two primary questions when asked about how this could work or would work or should work or shouldn't is two things. One, what is the problem that has been identified that we need to correct for? And I hear the commissioners talk about um, racial injustices and making sure that we don't have that. That's been part of an ongoing study with the CJCC that we're still working on. So I understand that, but I, the second part was then how is this office that's been recommended going to solve whatever that problem is and at the same time prevent the same issues that have caused multiple public defenders office around the country to shut down. Um, and, and my reason for having the position I've taken thus far is I've not heard an answer to either of those questions that makes sense for Douglas County because the long and the short of it is the things that have been addressed as items that this holistic defender's office could do, especially in terms of misdemeanors, one are, are not um, things that are not, they are things that are actually already being done or they are things that make sense uh, from an idealistic standpoint, but in practical reality for what we do in Douglas County um, would not make sense. And I, I use the example of having the practice that we now use at first appearances to determine what pretrial release provisions are appropriate. And before the CJCC had kind of worked through that and came up with a system that made sense, um, one of the things that was important was trying to have somebody there at first appearances. Now that we have a completely different setup in place, that doesn't make sense anymore. Um, the, the portions of that that were of concern, which was whether or not we had judges who were making decisions that were based in part um, on race issues, et cetera, whether or not those were being accounted for, those are now being done in a completely different way such that, that the appearance of an attorney for the defendant at first appearances no longer has, especially on misdemeanors, um, where they are almost always either issued a, a, a just a notice to appear in court or they are processed and immediately released on an OR bond. So that was a long winded answer to your question, Judge, but I think um, we are already doing the things, at least the things that he has identified specifically that would be a benefit from this from a misdemeanor perspective. And the other thing that I have a question about is th the position I understood was that they would take all of the misdemeanors, that they would have people who are qualified to do that, but how 
my, my practical question is how then do you also have those same attorneys have enough felony experience to be able to take on um, or be qualified in the bid system to do the higher level felonies? Because I think what I heard him say is if you have a client who has a defendant who has a misdemeanor and a felony, that their office would be wanting to take both of those. But there are some requirements that BIDS has in place in terms of how much uh, work you have to do, how much trial experience you have to have, and the level of cases that you have in order to take on the felony. So if you have all of the misdemeanor cases, how is your workload for those attorneys uh, going to be structured to allow them to do all of that, plus enough felony work to get them qualified as a bids attorney? I think a fair question. My understanding coming into this meeting was less getting into, I think those are practical realities that might be answered, but my, as I've asked, as, I, as I've been talked to and tried to figure out this current discussion, and I very much agree with Commissioner Portillo, this is a discussion that cycles through, and it cycles through in lots of communities, and, you know, we can look at what we're doing, and look at what's being proposed, and see, is there, are there advantages, are there deficits, and I have heard from the panel, what are the deficits? Why are we being criticized? I don't, I don't take it as criticism. I take it as we do have all of these new uh, commissioners. We have a new sheriff. We have a new DA. We, we're, we're a community that's looking at, is there something to improve? My, I keep going back to, not to denigrate any of it, I think attorneys who have done mostly defense work have done most of these things for as long as I've been practicing law and it's just being presented or repackaged. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. I do not mean that in a negative way. What I, but I think we've got attorneys with different levels of experience and history. We've got commissioners who have varying levels of exposure to the criminal system. And I'm sitting here as a person just saying, my perspective is I want effective, competent representation for people and I want them to get paid. And the judges have discussed this. We, we have discussed among ourselves in, with the benefit of participating in CJCC and hearing the different programs and CJS, what is it that we're trying to improve? And I think the misdemeanor only is a, a really a specialty niche in a lot of ways because there is so much crossover. So again, I, Mr. Natali said, here's what we can offer. I think what I'm hearing the defense attorneys on the panels or the, at the part of this say, for the most part, those things are occurring. And if there's a choke point, it's that there's a limitation on how many services are available and who can afford those services. And I don't know that plugging new attorneys into the equation addresses that aspect of it. And that's really my two cents on, on this current topic of discussion. I'm the team here. I'm just going to chime in and say, as the timekeeper, we've got about 15 minutes left uh, or so before we would need to take a break before we move on to the regular county commission agenda. And I know there's at least two more speakers and a lot of questions. So if we we can just keep that in mind as in our comments that we need to keep moving through this, I'd appreciate just I want everyone to get a chance to present. Can I can I throw one more thing in? Sorry, Sarah. I think this is a conversation that should probably go on beyond this work session sure. uh, in, in other contexts. And I'm just saying I'm, I'm willing to look at ways to engage that beyond this discussion. I don't think we're going to decide things today. Yeah, I'll just reiterate what I said at the top of the meeting, that this is the really the first conversation of this at the Board of County Commission level in probably a year or so. It was discussed a while back. So this is a very, no decisions are going to be made today. This is simply for educational purposes only. There's a lot more that needs to be uh, discussed and revealed. So uh, I, I'll just say that again for the group. And I'll be quiet. I, I, I didn't. Well, Judge, I think that you may be one of those two speakers that we still have left on our agenda. So we don't need you to be quiet. If you if you have more comments that you want to say, we want to make sure that you have the space to say them. I, I, I realize I've already, I'm, I, others to speak to. I'm, I'm glad to, I, I could consume the hour and, and I don't know that that would be a benefit, but I think there is more conversation that needs to occur.
I mean, if that's a vote for me to continue so, talking. Mike, is our, well, I guess my question is, is our next, who's the person next on our agenda to speak? We're kind of open for discussions and questions now, so. Okay, all right. I just want to be clear just as to make sure we're following what we told people we were going to do, but. We do have a, a PowerPoint presentation that's more geared towards the issue of bids establishing a public defender's office here. And I could share my screen and go through that. And it's mostly, uh, you know, relying upon statistics and um, reports from bids. And uh, this is Mike Brower. Uh, Brandon on that, uh, Brent Barrett on, on that topic, um, there will be a public discussion um, on the bids assessment decision. Well, actually, a, a public discussion that will be part of the decision making process. We're not there today, right? Am I correct? That's correct. So, so Mike, I don't, or Clark, I, I, I don't want to shoot you down there, but I, I don't know that we're ready yet for that. Um, but um, I certainly want that to be part of the bids assessment. And, and it's one of the reasons that we value your involvement. Um, I have know, a follow-up question for Mr. Natali, and I want to make sure I'm understanding the proposal. The social workers and the support advocates, a social worker, are they going to provide substantive social work services to the person, or are they going to help direct them to resources in the community? Because maybe I'm misunderstanding some of that. Yeah, so there's a number of different models, again, based on the context. So, for instance, in Hennepin County, Minnesota, they have a holistic model in which people on, uh, are on loan from some other service provider that are in-house, right? Same office, you walk over to their desk, they're right there, uh, but they're on loan because they are primarily through some other provider, but they're a member of the defense team. Um, I think at the Bronx Defenders, the way that we did it was that the social worker did not provide direct services but did two things, um, you know, helping with care coordination, but also really importantly, helping analyze and understand the issues that were at play for the purposes of sentencing advocacy, mitigation. Um, and so at the Bronx Defenders, our social workers uh, were part of the defense team, uh, were within the bounds of attorney-client confidentiality as part of the defense team, um, providing uh, the service of helping the attorney understand the mental health needs of the client um, and also helping uh, facilitate the preparation of defense. And also, and that may include, right, uh, working with the client to uh, do care coordination or work with another care coordinator or, um, you know, there's a variety of different ways that a social worker, depending on the web of services that are otherwise available might participate. But I think the core things are the ideas you want somebody on the defense team who can facilitate with the communication, the attorney's understanding and the court and be able to provide the court understanding of exactly what's going on here with this person's issues. Uh, whether just they are- thinking, thinking out loud, you know, we've got, we have a wide variety of people on our panel. And I think of panel attorneys who refer people to you know, non-traditional routes that based on who that person is and the community they come from and sort of the, the worldview that they possess. And there's just a lot of creativity. And I've seen that over my entire time of practice. And so I throw that out as, as we start having these discussions, there's pros and cons to it. And institutional organizations tend to become institutional thinkers. And so I, I, I just, I know that that occurs um, in a tremendous amount of ways on the, in the current system that are no cost to the attorney, no, no cost to the county. And I've seen some of those be amazing uh, referrals for people. Yeah, I agree completely. And that's, again, you know, I flagged this in my statement. This is part of what we're doing is creating an advisory panel of uh, practitioners and, and heads of holistic offices around the country, but also local panel attorneys um, to find these best practices. And this is the idea of an institution that can, uh, you know, take the systems and practices that are working the best here or elsewhere, 
um, and systematize them so that any attorney can take advantage of these. And, you know, I think what Jennifer said was exactly correct. We want this to be a resource for attorneys the way the federal defenders is a resource for attorneys. There's no reason that, you know, um, panel attorneys couldn't, for instance, refer to uh, some of these services that we're providing if they're all in one place. Um, and I, uh, and while I have the opportunity, I kind of wanted to ask uh, Mr. Barrett um, on the holistic question from the bids perspective, I understand that Bids has been somewhat interested in exploring uh, this model as well. Um, and if you had any insights on, you know, how this differs from what we might call traditional practice or, uh, or if, you know, um, from your experience or Bids's position on um, the types of uh, practices that would be included in this, in this model and whether the state is considering adopting some of those that we've seen practice successfully at, for instance, the federal defenders here in Kansas? Holistic defense is something that's being looked at at the bids level, but exactly what form that would take is not yet decided. Um, there, unfortunately, are a number of factors we have to deal with involving legislative funding that are somewhat outside of our control and limit our flexibility. So while that discussion is ongoing, I don't have any sort of formal, you know, A to B to C answer for you of what that might look like. Commissioner Portillo, this is Commissioner Kelly. Sorry to ask a question. I know we're getting down to the end of our time. Commissioner Kelly, I definitely want to get your question. I've noticed that Commissioner Reed has been off mute for a while. So I just want to check in with her and then go to you and make sure that we wrap up on time. So, but time for both of your questions if you both have them. Thank you. I um, I don't think I have any glaring questions at the moment. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, and to your question, Judge McCabry, about, um, you know, of the, the two defense attorneys that are here um, to represent that point of view about, you know, what is Sam and Kansas Holistic Defenders proposing that isn't being done. And to that, I would say, I don't think that, um, I, my perception is that we don't have enough continuity of defense services. There's just, we, um, of course, it is true that there are a number of attorneys who are providing those supports and services and are well connected to agencies um, and working with criminal justice services and all the pretrial supports. Um, but I don't think that answer can be possibly true of every attorney on the panel. There's turnover on the panel. There's different capacity of different law offices. Some are individual practitioners. Some are part of larger offices that have support staff like paralegals. Um, investigators that may be useful, even in some misdemeanor cases. Um, so I think that from my perception, that there's an opportunity to really create um, continuity in how we provide defense services in this community across misdemeanors and felonies with the acknowledgement that people, uh, as, as Shay Downing pointed out, um, are often experiencing multiple cases and that an attorney, uh, having attorneys who are skilled in those areas um, and can be, I, I appreciate knowing that Shawnee County's way of kind of uh, seems, a, a sounds like it's perhaps a bit disjointed and that that's a good note for us to be conscious of the fact that currently Douglas County is doing a good job of making sure that a same defendant with mul different cases from different times gets the same attorney and has continuity of care uh, and advocacy there. Um, and then I also just want to, um, so, and I say that, I mean, as many of you in this call know, I am a court advocate for the Domestic Violence Center in town, and so that is very much based in my experience working with um, folks in this community who've had a variety of court cases and knowing that um, they are not getting all of the same connections and supports um, and full advocacy of every attorney. Um, in, that they might be appointed. And I think there's something to be said for an office that has uh, oversight and institutionalized training and support staff um, can contribute a lot to, to that. And then I also just want to point out that um, to Mike Clark's comments, what I've heard from Brandon um, Barrett's presentation, from Jennifer Roth and Sam Allison Natale's comments, um, and, and Mike Brower's comments from the county perspective is, I heard Brandon talk about, um, 
you know, the need for a symbiotic relationship, um, hearing Jennifer talk about hybrid systems working and functioning well, and that that is what helps create a healthy ecosystem. And that makes sense to me. So I am hearing <clears throat> in all of the conversations that began last year, or as Judge McCabe pointed out, are cyclical throughout the years, um, that there is a desire and a willingness to be collaborative and figure out where do we identify the gaps and acknowledge that there are gaps. There's always gaps and there's always rooms for room for improvement. And that's not a critique or an attack on people rendering those services currently. It's an acknowledgement that we have an opportunity to, to do more um, and that we have an opportunity to collaborate and figure out what um, symbiosis can look like in Douglas County to address the, the practical needs of people going through our system um, and be mutually beneficial to private practitioners um, throughout the county. I just want to pipe in. I absolutely believe there can be very good public defender's offices, very good holistic defender's offices, very good panel uh, systems. I do think Douglas County has one of the best. I think we should always look at ways to improve. All the comments I have will not fit in the time, this is we're over time. So uh, there's so many things that influence each of those uh, dynamic, each of those uh, models. Commissioner Kelly, go ahead, thank you. Appreciate your comments. Um, appreciate everybody being here as well. I, and actually, as I'm thinking through my question, it may be better to respond by email to us. I, I think what Judge McCabria said, we need to have a longer discussion for sure. Um, but, but I'm, I'm really there's been some discussion about racial equity, and it's a real goal of mine to reduce the disparities that we see at Douglas County Jail when it comes to race. Um, and I know that my two colleagues are have much more experience with this system than I do. So this may be something that's obvious to everybody else, but I'm really interested to hear. And like I said, you can send it to me in an email. That'd be fine. Uh, from each system, from, from bids, from the holistic system and from our, our public defense bar, like what strategies do you think are going to change those numbers and and how might your working together if if we think a hybrid system would actually be better how might that change those numbers as well so so that there's there's two parts there um i'm seeing heads nod so maybe my question is making sense um but I, i'm just really interested in how we reduce those numbers and what specific strategies we have to change the racial disparities in our jail. I, did, I don't think I saw any of that in any of the presentations that I watched, so maybe I missed it, but I wanna make sure that we don't lose that focus um, um, in our discussions. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. And I do think that, that is, that's something that we need to have a lot of much longer conversations about. So I, I would be interested if folks are emailing the commissioner while the three commissioners can't talk amongst ourselves via email we can receive more information so i think we would all be open to receiving more information from the defense bar from holistic defenders and how we can kind of think through all of this and i i am sure that that will be continued conversations as part of the cjcc's work and part of our continued conversations um, from the county commission perspective so i appreciate you raising those questions commissioner kelly i think with that since we are right at 5.15, we will recess until we get to 5.30 for our um, County Commission business meeting. Unless Sarah, do we have anything else? Uh, I don't I don't have anything at this time. I think we, or Mike, I think there are some follow-ups that we can do as staff and uh, try to get back to the commission and the public as a whole as we continue to have these discussions. Yeah, Commissioner Patino, I just wanna make sure there wasn't any clear um, direction us to um, follow up with this uh, for the commission. There seems to be a lot here. Um, and I wanna make sure that we're, we're meeting your needs um, as well as um, the timeliness of, of, of doing this follow-up. And, and so if you have some expectations 
or, or we can talk later about that, um, but I wanna, I'll be happy to facilitate that. I, I appreciate that, Mike. And I do think it would be good for both us as the commission and for the public to kind of see what the timelines are for, I mean, we, we had a quick discussion of the timeline for the bids process and what it looks like for Douglas County to be in that evaluation period. But if we could maybe get a very clear timeline to share with the public for the bids process and how that evaluation will move forward. And then a timeline for you know, what would it mean to consider something like holistic defenders for the misdemeanor process within our community, just so that we can be very clear with ourselves and with the public on what these timelines look like for continued conversations. I think as everyone has brought up, we need a lot more conversation and where and when we might get more public input. I know that we, we had quite a few speakers, so we didn't have a chance to get have any input from the public, but I would really love to hear what the public thinks about this. And so a space for us to kind of think through that piece of it as well. Um, but then I think just continuing these conversations. I think those sound like great follow-up items. I think Mike and I can work to, to put some of those pieces together in addition to some of the current spending data and some of the current data in terms of misdemeanors and felonies and try to, where we can, I know there's some holes in some of the data pieces, but we can put that back together, bring it back before the commission as a whole, along with any public feedback we talk about and then discuss next steps. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we will really be recessed until 5.30 until our business meeting. Thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate all of the conversation, all of the information, and all the ways we're continuing to move this conversation forward in Douglas County. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for inviting us to participate. I appreciate it.